Lord. Somebody shout a loud hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I welcome you to church. I welcome you to church. Come on, welcome somebody. Tell them I see you. I see you. I welcome. It's good to have you online. It's good to have you on board. It's good to have you here. I welcome you to church. And I also welcome you to the new biblical calendar. Hallelujah. You know, this is a new year for, for the Jews. It's, it's a new Jewish calendar in the Bible. So it's a, even the Bible has calendar. So it's a new biblical calendar for us. So I welcome you to the new year of Rosh Hashanah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I welcome you. It's what Rosh Hashanah is the marking of the 10 days of all. It's a time of introspection where we, we, we reflect. We look into ourselves. We rededicate our, ourselves to God. So I will encourage you, if you don't know much about it, read, research, you know, dig, study to show yourself approved. It's a time of reflection, a time of rededication, a time of introspection, a time that we set ourselves apart. It's the beginning of a new year. It is a time when the shofar is being blown. And when the shofar is blown, it indicates, it signifies victory. And even as you are, you, you've entered into this new year, into the season of Rosh Hashanah, I decree over you that even as the angels blow the shofar, you are entering into a season of back-to-back victory in the name of Jesus. As the shofar is being blown, remember every time the shofar was blown in the Bible, the children of Israel always had victory. And as the shofar is blown in the realm of the spirit, you are entering to your season of victory, unlimited victory, back to back victory in the name of Jesus. Praise be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I will say the year has just begun for us. It has just been got, begun for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So this morning, we are just diving right in. We will be continuing from where we stopped last week. Last week, we closed with the story of blind Bartimaeus who cried out to Jesus for help, for mercy. And that is going to be the basis for our deliberation this morning. So I'll be speaking on supernatural help. So you can, you can say supernatural help too. Hallelujah. So this morning, I'll be speaking on supernatural help, a continuation of from where we stopped. We stopped at blind Bartimaeus screaming and asking Christ for help. So turn your Bibles with me to the book of Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10 and from verse 46 to 40, 51. I'm going to be reading it step by step. Mark chapter 10, 46 to 51. It says, they came to Jericho and as Jesus was leaving with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. <laughs> I love that. Now the word of God says when he heard that it was Jesus who was coming, who was passing by, who was passing through. He began to scream, Jesus, 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 son of David, have mercy on me. And one would wonder, why did he begin to scream when he heard it was Jesus? Why did he begin to scream? First of all, I want to thank God that the enemy stole his sight, but did not steal his hearing. You know, sometimes you think the enemy has stolen something from you and that is the end. Look, whatever it is the enemy has stolen from you, there is still something that you need that God reserved and hid from him that he has not stolen from you. You still have something. Hallelujah. You still have something. Don't focus on what he has taken. If you focus on what he has taken, you will not be able to recover that which he has taken. Focus on what you still have because with what you still have, you are, it is with what you have that you recover what the enemy has stolen or what he has taken. Hallelujah. So the, the enemy took his sight, but he didn't take his hearing. And with his hearing, he heard that Jesus was passing through and he began to scream. He began to scream. Why did he begin to scream? He began to scream because he heard of all the glorious deeds of Jesus. He heard how Jesus healed the sick. He heard how Jesus raised the dead. He heard how Jesus fed the 5,000, the 4,000. He heard how Jesus walked on the sea. He heard how just the hem of his garment was able to heal the woman with the issue of blood. He heard so many things that Jesus had done. He heard how he turned water into wine and, uh, and, and removed shame from the couple that the enemy had programmed shame for. He heard, he heard so many things. He heard how he rose Jairus' daughter from the dead. He heard so many things and he said, what? 
If Jesus, if all I have heard, if all I have heard is true, then I believe this man can help me. I have heard that he has sent an out an open invitation. He said, come on to me, all you who are labored and heavy laden and burdened with problems, I am ready to give you rest. He said, wow, if I have, if all these things I have heard is true. Remember, he could not see, so he does not know if they are true or not. He has not witnessed it firsthand. All he did was hear the stories, hear the rumors, but he still latched on what he heard. He still held on to what he heard. He said, if all I have heard is true, then I'm not going to keep my mouth shut. If it's that same man who has done all these and many more that is passing by, I am not going to keep shut. I am going to get his attention. Then I believe if he did it for those, if what I've heard is true, then mine is too small for him. And he began to scream and he began to scream. And he got the attention of Jesus. He screamed for his attention. In the same way, in the same manner, we have heard all that God can do. But we've not just heard all that he can do. We've also heard of all he has done. We've seen stories in the Bible. We've heard physical testimonies from people we know. You know, so we've heard of not just what he can do, but of what he has already done and what he is still doing. And we've read his promises to us in Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 that he says, I will help you with the right hand of my righteousness. I will uphold you. He, we have heard and seen and read these things. Now, just like blind Bartimaeus, we now have the responsibility to act on what we've heard. Blind Bartimaeus did not just stop at hearing. He acted on what he heard. A lot of times we hear hear things and we don't act on what we hear. If you don't act on what you hear, then what you heard would not produce results for you. He acted on what he heard for him to have results. It is now our responsibility after hearing, after reading, after seeing what God can do, what he has done. It is now our responsibility to act on what we've heard, not to keep our mouth shut, not to keep quiet. You've now got to ask for help. Hallelujah. You've heard that he can help. You've heard that he can redeem. You've heard that he helped, actually. You heard that he redeemed. You heard that he made whole. You heard that he set the captives free. You have heard all these things. What do you do with what you've heard? It is now time to act on what you've heard. Which is, number one, you've got to ask for help. You've got to open your mouth, lift your voice, and ask for help. That is the first way on acting on what you've heard. There is no doubt that God is willing to help us. There is no doubt that he's not just willing, but he's able to help us. But to, to receive this help, to be a beneficiary of this help, you also have a part to play. You also have a part to play. Any gospel, any religion that, that, that is void of responsibility to you is a false gospel. It's a false religion. We all have our responsibilities to play. Hallelujah. And your responsibility is to ask. You have to ask for this help. You cannot just stop at desiring and wishing. Ah, I wish. Ah, I wish God could just answer me now. I wish this could just happen now. I wish this door could just open now. I wish that, that you, you can't wish. They say if wishes were horses, even beggars would run. You can't wish. You can't stop at wishing. You can't stop at desiring. Blind Bartimaeus wasn't wishing. He acted on what he heard. You have the responsibility, the sole responsibility to act on what you've heard. Hallelujah. And you cannot just sit down and say, after all, he is God. He should know what I need. Isn't he God? He created me. He's the all-knowing God. He should know what I need. You, can, you, you cannot say that. You cannot say, after all, he is God. Yes, he is God. But there is a principle, a laid down principle. The Bible says, ask and it shall be given. You must ask. Matthew 7, 7. It says, ask and it shall be given. It is a principle. And God is God of order. It is a principle. Ask. Ask. Your responsibility is to ask. My responsibility is to give what you've asked. As long as it's in accordance to my will. Ask and it shall be given. Jeremiah 33 3 says, Call unto me and I will answer you. What an assurance. What an assurance God has given us. Ask and it shall be given. It's a principle. It's a, it, 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 God is God of order, like I said. And even when he's dealing with us, he still establishes this order. He still lays this order. We, we have to, he, cannot, he does not break his word. He does not break his, 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 his order. He, he, he's a God of order. He, he observes decorum. He's a God of order. Ask and it shall be given. 
So if you would only ask, and when you ask, help is available to you. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. But the problem is, we ask everybody else around us for help. We call our families far and wide and ask for help. We seek counsel from other people. We even ask Google for help. Yeah, we even ask Google. Something is wrong and we start asking, Google, what is this, 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 this? What is the meaning of this dream? What is the symptom of what I'm having this symptom? We even ask Google. We ask everyone for help except God. We run to everyone for help except God. And that is why we struggle. That is why we struggle. That is why it seems things are not going the way we want. Because we are seeking help from the wrong source. God is the only source of our help. But we, we, we run to man for help. We cry to man for help. We depend on man for help. And we ignore the true source. We ignore the right source. We ignore the proper source. We make God our last port of call. When he is supposed to be the first port of call. When we are in trouble. When we are in need. When you ask somebody for help. When you go to someone and ask for help, you are demonstrating and expressing your belief and your faith in the person's ability to help you. I cannot ask you for help if I don't believe you can help me. So when you ask someone for help, you are expressing and demonstrating your belief, your faith, your trust in that person's ability to help you. The Bible says that for everyone that God healed, there was something he said to them. He said to them, your faith has made you whole. That's what the Bible says. For everyone Christ healed, for everyone he restored life to, for everyone he delivered, for everyone he saved, for every miracle he did, there was something he said to them. He said to them, your faith had made you whole. Even the prayers we took this morning of, of our inter, 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 intercessory prayers, he said to them, and the Bible says, and Jesus saw their faith. Your faith. Your faith has made you whole. So when you ask for help, when you seek help from people, anyone you seek help from, you are expressing your faith in that person. You are telling that person that I believe you can do this. I trust in your ability to do this. I know you can help me. That is what, when you seek help from anyone, that is what you are saying and doing and expressing. And God wants us to express this faith, demonstrate this faith and trust in him and him alone. When we call on God when we are confused, when we call on God when we are in need, when we call on God when we are afraid, when we call on God when we are in trouble, we are demonstrating our trust and our faith in him to deliver us. We are demonstrating our trust and our faith in him to help us, to make a way for us, to rescue us, to save us, to show up for us. That is what we do. When we call on him, that is what we do. And he does not want this faith to be to be in anyone else other than him. He wants us to put our faith, our entire faith, our entire trust, our entire hope in him. And that is why the Bible says, and they that trust in the Lord will never be ashamed. For the scripture says, they that trust in the Lord will never be ashamed. They that trust in the Lord will never be ashamed. Hebrews 3.15 So when you go to God for help, you are expressing and demonstrating your trust in him. You never seek help from somebody with a lesser ability. No matter how stranded you are, no matter how stuck you are, you don't go to somebody with a lesser ability. I'm not talking about um, physical strength right now. Because you may go to somebody who's younger than you, but he has the ability to help you. Because he has the, the know-how in that field. So you never go to somebody with a lesser ability for help because you know that you will not receive the help you need. You always go to somebody with a higher ability. So when even God himself tells us, call on me in the time of trouble and I will answer you. When God himself tells us, I would help you. What God is saying and telling us is that he's, 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 he's telling us that I have the power, I have the might, I have the ability, I have the strength to deliver you. When he says, call on me, that's what he's, tell, he's telling you invariably. He's telling you that, he, why he's telling you to call on him is because he wants you to know that him alone has the ability, him alone has the strength, him alone has the power, him, him alone has the might to help you. Our help is in the name of the Lord. And prayer is the way we ask God for help. We go to him and ask him for help through prayers. When I'm saying ask for help, ask for help, ask for help, I'm invariably saying pray. Prayer is the way we ask God for help. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Everything we've heard Christ do is meant to stir up faith in us. And that faith is meant to help us trust and lean on the Lord. Everything we have seen, the word of God rightly said that the scripture has been given to us for, for our, our own admonition. It is meant to admonish us, to stir something in us. So everything we have seen and read in the scripture that Christ has done and is able to do, it's to stir up faith in us. And that faith is meant to help us lean on him. It's meant to help us trust in him. It's meant to help us rely on him and depend on him. Hallelujah. Now, verse 48 says, you know, like I said, I'll be taking it step by step. Verse 48 of the same scripture says, <clears throat> Many of the people scolded him and told him to be quiet. When the man was screaming, when blind Bartimaeus was screaming and asking um, Christ for help, when he was screaming to gain Christ's attention, they told him to keep quiet. They said, many of the people scolded him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted even more loudly, Son of David! Have mercy on me. Now, to receive supernatural help, family, you must be steadfast. To receive supernatural help, you must be persistent. To receive supernatural help, you must be tenacious. Meaning you must not waver. Meaning you must not let yourself be intimidated by situations, by circumstance, by people. You must not let yourself be intimidated. You must be resolute. You must be constant if you want to receive help. Because there are things that will arise to shut you down. There are things that will arise to shut you up. There are things that will arise to frustrate you. There are things that will arise to intimidate you. But you must not let yourself be intimidated. This man was, well, this man was blind. He had a deficiency. So he could easily be intimidated. But he refused to let himself get intimidated by the crowd. He refused to let himself get intimidated by the people. He refused to let himself be shut down by the people. There are things, there are voices that would want to rise. There are voices that want to rise. Can you imagine somebody who is in need, who is blind, who is begging for arms, who is, whose life is on the, on the standstill, stagnated. He's just as if he's on the treadmill. You know what the treadmill is? You are running on the treadmill, but you're not going anywhere. His life was just like that, as if he was on the treadmill. He was not going anywhere. He was not going forward. He was not going backward. His life was on a standstill. And yet people could have, have the nerve to shut him down when he was crying for help. That is world we're living that is the world we're living they didn't even ask him they, the Bible says they scolded him they told him to shut up they did not ask him they told him you are becoming a public nuisance shut the hell up can you imagine the world we live in but the man refused to be shut down he refused to be intimidated the bible the more they tried to to, to to shut him down the louder he screamed so the more people try to intimidate you the more they, they mock you the more they ridicule you the more the situation gets worse that is the more you should pray that's when you should intensify in your prayers he did not allow the voice of the naysayers or the dis of, or dis discouragement to hinder him to stop him from crying out for help. He did not allow the voice of those people to silence his own voice of petition. The more they tried to stop him, he raised his voice louder and louder. What the enemy does is to infuse us with discouragement, which will produce weariness. They wanted to discourage him. They wanted to intimidate him. That's what the enemy does. He tries to intimidate us. And how does he try to intimidate us? When we are praying for a particular situation, we are crying to God for help. Lord, I've been on this circumstance for too long. I've been on this mountain for too long. It is time for me to advance. Lord, take me out of this dunghill. Lord, take me out of this pit. The more you try your praying, it looks as if the more you are sinking in, the more you are, you, 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 the problem is getting bigger and bigger. It looks as if the, the problem goes from bad to worse. The enemy is just trying to intimidate you, to cause you to believe that your prayer is not yielding any effect or any result that your prayer is going nowhere then it discourages you and when you get discouraged and intimidated you just lose the zeal the will to pray you think that is it you think that is it that is it now i want us to remember a story Talk, still talking about discouragement now in the bible the israelites when they were taken as slaves in egypt for the benefit of those who do not know this story the israelites were taken as slaves in egypt for 430 years and after so many years they began to cry they said do you know what we've had enough we've had enough we have, we've had enough lord please help us lord please take us out of this mess lord we've had enough that is why the bible says when isaac was blessing his son and esau realized that his his his, his blessing had been taken 
he has been conned out of his blessing and he cried and begged his father. I know I'm digressing a bit, but I just want us to get to the hang of what I'm saying. He cried and begged his father and said, Father, is there no more blessing? Even one. The father said to him, when you, are, when you become restless, when you are tired of your situation, when you're tired of serving your younger brother, then it is in that tiredness, in that restlessness, that you will be able to break the shackles of slavery, of bondage off your neck. Now they were tired. And when they were tired, they became restless. They said, do you know what? We, 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 we are tired of the circumstance. We need freedom. We need a change. We need deliverance. Family, you need to be in a position where you get tired of your present circumstance. That is when help comes. You need to be in a position where you are tired of what you are going through. I have had enough. Enough of the enemy playing games with my destiny. Enough of the enemy playing games with my future. Enough of the enemy playing games with my home. I am tired. I've had enough. Now they cried to God. And God sent them a deliverer in the person of Moses. And Moses went to Pharaoh and said to Pharaoh, Let the people of God go. Let my people go. And Pharaoh said, Wow. Okay. He called the taskmasters that were, that were already torturing and punishing the Israelites. And he said to the taskmasters, intensify their torture, intensify their job, double what they've been doing. Why? Because help was on the way. What was he doing? He was trying to intimidate them just in the bid to get them to shut up and not want that deliverance anymore. Just in the bid to get them to think, do you know what? I think we are better off this way. That's what the enemy does. The more you pray, you are praying about that circumstance, about that wife, about that husband, about that child, about that job, about that career, about your destiny, about whatever it is that you are that, that is confronting you, that is like a challenge in your life. The more you pray, the, the enemy makes it get worse. He makes it get worse in the bid to make you give up, in the bid to make you give in, in the bid to make you tired and accept it as a norm in your life. In the bid. To just make you accept it. Family, never settle for the norm that the enemy places over your life. Never settle for the norm that the enemy offers you. He tries to intimidate us. He tries to frustrate us. So that we can settle for the norm that he has offered us. For the norm that he has placed on us. Never, 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 never settle for the norm the enemy offers you. Never settle. He only does that because he sees that help is on the way. Pharaoh knew that help was on the way and out of fear he didn't want to lose his his slaves he said to the taskmasters intensify their torture the voice of the people that were speaking to blind Bartimaeus they were the voice of, the, of, of discouragement the voice of the enemy trying to shut him down to accept his state as his norm Never accept your state. It does not matter how long you've been going through it for. It does not matter how long it has lingered for. It does not matter how long it has persisted. You've prayed and prayed and prayed. Never accept it as your norm. That is not your norm. That is not your norm. Never accept your present situation as your permanent situation. Never. No matter how the enemy intimidates you, no matter how he tries to frustrate you, never accept it. The more they try to frustrate you, the more they try to intimidate you, family, pray better. Pray more. Pray harder. Scream louder. Just like blind Bartimaeus. Scream louder. Never accept his norm for your life. Never. Our norm as children of God is to live and function in the supernatural. That is our norm. As a child of God, you're supposed to operate in the supernatural. That the supernatural becomes your natural. That is, that is, that is our norm. Our norm is the supernatural. Being the natural. We live in the supernatural like it's a natural. Testimonies here and there. Miracles back and forth. Signs and wonders here and there. It becomes a norm. That is, that is the norm we are meant to live as children of the Most High God. If blind Bartimaeus had given in to the people who were scolding him to keep quiet, he wouldn't have received his miracle. And that is why I said to receive supernatural help, you must be persistent. You must be steadfast. You must be constant. Don't stop praying until your change comes. Job 14, 14 says, it's all the days of my appointed time. Will I wait until my change comes? What was Job saying? He said, if it takes me my entire life to wait for my change, I will wait for my change. I will not derail. I will not go to plan B. I will not seek help from somewhere else. If it takes my entire life to wait for my change, I will wait. All the days of my appointed time, will I wait until my change comes? If it takes my entire life for me to wait, 
I will wait for my change to come. So to receive supernatural help, you've got to be persistent. You've got to be constant. You've got to be resolute. You've got to be tenacious. You've got to be determined that no matter how the enemy fights, no matter which angle they come from, no matter how they intensify it, I will wait. I will pray. I will stay in God's presence. My change must come. Hallelujah. It may be getting worse, family. The situation may be getting worse. It may be getting worse. But it's only an indication that hell has noticed you. They know that something is about to happen in the realm of the spirit. They know that change is coming. They know that help is coming. And they try to intimidate you. Pharaoh knew that help was coming. All these years, they've been there as slaves. They've never gone to say, let us go. Let my people go. As soon as help, uh, 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 Moses came on the scene, he became afraid. He knew that something had changed in the, in, 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 in the realm of the spirit. He knew that something had changed in the camp of the Israelites. He knew that something was, things were no longer the same. He was also panicking. Oh my God, I'm going to lose these people. I'm going to lose these people. The enemy panics when your help comes because he just wants to lord over you. He just wants to, to, to trample upon you. He just wants to finish you. So he panics and he tries to scare you. He tries to intimidate you so that you keep shut. Never keep shut. The, when it gets worse, know that God has stepped in. When it gets worse, know that God is now at work. When it gets worse, know that your help is on the way. Hallelujah. It's an indication that help is coming your way. Hallelujah. So like blind Bartimaeus, pray the more. Don't stop. Don't slow down. Help is on the way. Hallelujah. Amen. Now verse 49 to verse 50 tells us. Verse 49 to verse 50. It says, Jesus stopped and said, Call him. When you don't stop, when you don't stop, God would not stop. That is the truth. When you don't stop, God's, God only stops when you stop. Remember when he was having this dialogue with, 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 with um, Abraham, talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, when he was telling Sodom and Gomorrah that um, he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and they were having this negotiation and, and, and Abraham was negotiating with God. What if there are 50 people God said I will not destroy? What if there are 40 people? What if there are 20 people? What if there are 10? God only stopped when Abraham stopped. God will only stop when you stop. As long as you don't stop, as long as you carry on, God will never stop on your matter. God will never stop on your case. So family, don't stop because God will only stop when you stop i am emphasizing i'm emphasizing so you have it in in you that god will only stop when you stop imagine if the guy had stopped he would have missed it but he kept screaming he kept shouting until he gained uh, he gained heaven's attention he kept screaming he kept shouting until he gained the attention of jesus he said to them call him for me the bible says so they called the blind man cheer up they said get up he is calling you. Get up. He is calling you. The same people who told him to keep shut. The same people who told him to keep quiet. The same people who told him that he was a public nuisance. Were the same people Christ sent to him to say, go call him for me. His, his prayers began to produce results. His screaming began to produce results. I decree over you that your prayers will produce results. In the name of Jesus, you will not pray in vain. For the Bible has not said, for the word of God has not said that we will seek him in vain. Your prayers will not be in vain. Your petitions will not be in vain they will produce results for you in the name of jesus they will produce results for you the same people that called me public news as oh is this god not great is this god not awesome the same people that told him to shut up the same people that scared him if, if you don't that threatened him if you don't keep quiet now we'll deal with you we'll throw you out of this place the same people called him and said it's okay it's okay cheer up now okay you've won ah oh, my god your enemy will tell you you've won in the name of Jesus. Your enemy will tell you you've won. Your adversary will tell you you've won. Your haters will tell you you've won. In the name of Jesus. These same people said to him, it's okay. Cheer up, cheer up. Laugh now. Smile. You can smile. Smile now. He's calling you. He told him he, he's calling you. Family. Don't be surprised when the same ones that mocked you, hey, when the same ones that laughed at you, when the same ones that ridiculed you, will be the same one God uses and God sends to serve you. Hmm. 
don't be surprised don't be surprised don't be surprised the bible says in second samuel chapter 2 uh, 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 22 verse 45 it says strangers will submit themselves unto me he said as soon as they hear they will, they will be obedient unto me don't be surprised family that the same ones that laughed at you the same ones that mocked at you and questioned your god and questioned your faith don't be surprised when it's that happening because those same ones they will be the ones to serve you in the name of jesus they will be the ones to serve you they served him they say come he's calling you your adversaries will serve you your enemies will serve you in the name of jesus and the man rose and came why because he didn't stop why because he persevered why because he pressed in why because he was tenacious he was determined he wanted this change he wanted this miracle he was restless until you are restless the chains of captivity cannot be broken until you are restless the chains of slavery cannot be broken is somebody restless do i have a restless person in the house this morning do i have a restless person in the house this is somebody is a restless person listening to me are you tired of where you are then don't stop praying are you tired of where you are then don't stop believing are you tired of where you are then don't stop serving are you tired of where you are then don't stop screaming because help would come when you don't stop help will come when you don't stop hallelujah help will come when you don't stop now there is something worth taking note of in verse 15 verse 50 says so he threw his cloak jumped up and came to jesus when he said to him when he said to them bring him call him the Bible says, so he threw off his cloak. Kandalaya Shasaya. He threw off his cloak. He jumped up and he came to Jesus. Why would the Bible highlight to us that he threw off his cloak? Because it was important. Because it is important. The word of God says, if your right eye would hinder you, would be the reason that you don't make heaven, would be the reason that you, you, you miss it in life. The Bible says, pluck off your right eye. If that relationship will be the reason you miss it. If whatever it is in your life will be the reason you miss it. The Bible says, pluck it off. The coat there, the cloak he was wearing represented anything and everything that would have hindered him from receiving his help so he removed the obstacle he took away the barrier he took away the hindrance whatever it is that is going to hinder me this cloak is hindering me i can't walk fast i can't go further candle with this cloak i will not go far with this cloak i will not go fast he took everything that stood as an hindrance he took off everything that stood as an obstacle he took off everything that stood as a blockage and he went to jesus what is that thing in your life that would hinder you despite how much you've tried how hard you've prayed what is that thing that will hinder you from receiving your help from the lord what is that thing that would hinder you from getting to your next level what is that thing the bible calls them those sins that easily beset us those wait 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 they are heavy you know when you're carrying a, 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 a heavy luggage you can't walk fast it pulls you you know you try but because of the the, 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 the luggage the weight of the luggage you are slow your pace is slow because it's pulling you back what is that thing you are carrying that would hinder you from receiving god's help what is that thing that you are carrying that would hinder you from gaining heaven's attention what is that thing that you are carrying that will hinder you from advancing from getting to your next level from crossing over into your next dimension what is that thing what is that thing i'm going to be stopping here today because that is going to be the basis for our deliberation next week by god's grace god willing i'm going to be stopping here but the food for thought for you to look within. Thank God that we are in Rosh Hashanah, the time of reflection. It's time for us to look within. What is that weight I am carrying that will not let me cross over? What is that weight I am carrying that will not let me advance? What is that weight I am carrying that will not let me receive my help, receive my breakthrough, receive the answers to my petition? What is that thing I am carrying? I will stop here and would we'll use this as a, a, a base, a foundation for next week by God's grace. If you've been blessed in any way by this word, I want you to lift up your voice and just begin to say, Father, I'm grateful for your word. Lord, I am thankful for your word. Lord, I give you praise for your word. Thank you for your word that has come forth. Thank you for your word. 
I don't know how the word touched you. I don't know how it ministered to you, but you know. So I lift up your voice and say, Father, thank you for the word you have sent to me this morning. Thank you for the word you have released into my circumstance this morning. Thank you for the word of reproof. Thank you for the word of instruction, for the word of relief, for the word of direction. Thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I want us to pray. This guy didn't stop until he gains heaven's attention. His prayer, his screaming, finally produced results in his life. I want you to lift up your voice where you are and say, Father, let my service to you produce results. Let my prayers produce results. Let me not serve in vain. Let me not pray in vain. Let me not believe in vain. Let me not trust in vain. Let my service to you produce results, O oh God. In the name of Jesus, let my prayers deliver to me answers. It's enough, in, in, enough is enough of praying and praying and praying without seeing results. I decree that I'm entering into my season of results. Let my prayers begin to yield results now. Let my prayers begin to yield results now. I want to see results. I want to see answers to my prayers. In the name of Jesus, I want to see results. Let my prayer produce results in the name of Jesus. And there is one thing. That is very vital and important. The guy was steadfast. In spite of the odds. In spite of the discouragement. In spite of the naysayers. He was steadfast. He was constant. He was tenacious. He was resolute. I want you to lift up your voice and say, Father, the grace to be steadfast in my request. The grace to be steadfast. Oh, in the pursuit of my change, of my miracle. Father, release to me. I will not give in to the, to, to the wiles of the enemy. I will not give in to discouragement. I will not give in to frustration. I will not give in to fear. I receive the grace to be steadfast in the name of Jesus. I receive the grace to be, to, be, to be resolute in the name of Jesus. I receive the grace to persevere, to hold on. I receive the grace to hold on. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The Bible says, family, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So Christ knew the joy that was set before him. He knew that he was the prize for our sins. But he also saw his prize. God opened his eyes to his prize. And because he saw his prize, it was the prize he saw that gave him the grace to be steadfast. It was the prize he saw that gave him the grace to persevere, to hold on in spite of the pain, in spite of the odds. I want us to lift up our voice this morning. I didn't plan for this prayer, but as it came, say, Father, open my eyes to my prize. Because sometimes we give in. Sometimes we give up because we can't see the prize. We try and try and try. And you know what? I surrender. You give in to the enemy because you can't see the prize. Your prize. For the joy that was set before him. He saw the joy. He saw himself seated at the right hand of God the Father forever and ever. And no more was he just the word, but he became son. No more was he just word, but he became son. He saw the prize. He saw the souls that were reconciled to God. God opened his eyes. He saw this prize. And because he saw it, it was easy for him to hold on. Sometimes, you know, we can, we've been in situations for way too long that... We wonder, would it ever happen again? But if only we can see the prize, I'm sure we would hold on. Say, Father, open my eyes to my prize in the name of Jesus. Open my eyes, show me my prize so that I don't give up, so that I don't give in. Open my eyes, Lord. Open our eyes, Holy Spirit. Show us our prize in the name of Jesus. There is a prize for tenacity. There is a prize for perseverance. There is a prize for steadfastness. There is a prize for consistency. Open my eyes to my prize, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Open my eyes to my prize. Thank you, precious Father. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. Blessed be your name, Father, for this wonderful time we've had in your presence, for the word that has come forth. I decree that this word will take full root in our lives. Nothing will steal this word. No circumstance, no situation will steal this word. In the name of Jesus, it will produce fruits in the name of Jesus. Thank you, precious Father. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, family.